I'm going to talk a little bit about Pirate Bay, and I think that's why you're here. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that we were that big here, but that's that's interesting. So um, I have I have to be very honest. I haven't prepared for this talk very much. I'm going to reuse something. I copied old stuff I've done before. And since I'm a bit lazy nowadays, I just entered lots of funny video clips. But everyone here is watching funny video clips on Reddit anyhow, so I think you're happy with that. So a little about my background, um, why I'm interested in what I'm interested in is that I, um, I grew up, I'm 36, we just found out I'm 36, I forgot. Um, when, when, when I was growing up, I got a computer really early. I was nine, something like that, so before all of you were born, I had a computer. And basically, I could not use this machine without copying everything I, you know, I could use it for. So I copied floppy disks of friends and everything. And uh, everything that I know today is because I copied stuff. So I copied movies, I copied software, I copied everything. I learned how to code because I copied uh, different compilers and stuff like that. Um, so without me copying anything, I couldn't be a person. Just as I copy people's behavior and I copy people's thoughts, it, it kind of was an essence to me that I could copy things. And then when I was growing up, I found out that people think that copying is bad. I couldn't kind of realize that me as being a copy of other people would be a bad thing. Uh, and one thing that really struck me was when I saw this really awful video clip. And this is not a joke. I hope this works. Jackie and I are on a mission to stop piracy. If this were a movie, we could take on the bad guys ourselves. But this is the real world. We need your help. When you buy pirate movie and music, you support criminals. Now these criminals are counterfeiting other things, like electronics and medicine. Take action. Demand the real thing. Help us stop piracy. Let's terminate it. Yeah, so, so this kind of jokey thing where some of the two of the richest people in the world is telling me and other people that kind of what I've become is a bad thing and I'm supporting criminals, and you know, this is counterfeiting and terrorism, we're funding all of this shit. It, have anyone ever paid for a, a pirated copy of something in here? Hands up. Did you actually pay for something? Well, s one guy, uh, there's a guy. <laughs> there is this website on the internet, you know, if you go there, you don't have to pay. And, and that's kind of, so I realized that kind of the discussion about copyright and piracy and all of this uh, had nothing to do with you know, the money and making money, it had to do with control over information. So um, I saw this video clip and I started reading about all of these things and I noticed there were some other people in Sweden, where I lived at the time, who started um, a group called uh, the Bureau of Anti-Piracy. And they were really, really awful. They sent out press releases saying that, you know, basically people file sharing mu music on the internet are responsible for taking 50% of the B uh, GDP of Sweden. They're stealing this money. This could go to healthcare and stuff like that, which is a big lie. Um, so some other really clever people started the Bureau for Piracy. Um, so they basically took the name and removed anti and became like a better remix of the first name. And of course, people in media thought that the, the Bureau for Piracy was first and that the Bureau against Piracy was against this organization. So we kind of showed that you can take a name and remix it in, and make a better original. Um, and we did lots of like funny stuff like that. So um, we were a group of hackers and intellectuals and poets and we had, you know, everyone from different agendas uh, and different kind of backgrounds joined to do funny things about the internet. So we went out on um, 1st of May and we demonstrated, that we said that we need fiber cables all over Sweden, uh, otherwise we don't have actual welfare. Uh, we said that, you know, these ISPs are really stupid, you could vote on which ISP should have to shut down and, you know, all of these kind of weird, you know, websites and projects. And one of them uh, became the Pirate Bay. Uh, and the Pirate Bay was uh, a system that we, we just wanted people to start using better technology uh, for, for downloading. Because before Pirate Bay, people used something called Direct Connect, and they used something called Napster, and different uh, places. And one of the issues is with those systems is that you're downloading from a person. So you're downloading from just one person's computer. And it's really slow, and it's not really good. 
Um, so Pirate Bay uses torrent technology, which Feroz was here a few days ago and talked everything about how torrents work, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but it became kind of uh, a big site in the end. And the reason was not actually that we had a good technology. It was because everyone else got shut down. And we refused to do that. And because we refused, Pirate Bay grew and, and uh, basically replaced everyone else. This is the only slide that has any sort of information you're ever going to need from me. Um, this is how big Pirate Bay was when we still had a tracking system. And basically, you could see that over half of the internet traffic was, at a certain time, there was uh, by Pirate Bay users. And this does not go unnoticed. So basically, half of the traffic in every fiber cable in the world was a Pirate Bay user downloading probably a movie or something other shitty stuff. So these companies that were not really happy about that, they started sending threatening letters to us. Basically, they did that to everyone who were running some sort of um, competition, as I would like to see it. Um, usually, they sent a letter to you know, someone and they shut down a website. There is a site called, or was a site called Supernova, which was the biggest torrent site before Pirate Bay. And there's a guy, a uh, friend of mine now, he got a letter saying, basically, you have to shut down the site or we're going to sue you for more money than there is actually printed in the world. <laughs> and when you're 17 years old and you get a letter like that, you can't even afford the postage to send a reply back. <laughs> you're not going you know, to, you're not going to fight it. So we actually started discussing you know, how to deal with getting all of these threatening letters. This is a polar bear. <laughs> have you seen one before? <laughs> we have those in uh, northern parts of Scandinavia, actually only on the Arctic, but never mind. Um, when we got threatening letters from Hollywood, we replied by sending a picture like this. <laughs> <laughs> and this is way before Reddit and 4chan, let me tell you. Um, we also sometimes said that, well, you might have a problem with us violating some copyright law over there in the US, but we have these guys trying to eat us. So see you if they don't kill us first. <laughs> and the thing is, when you reply like that, people don't know how to respond. So they stopped sending letters. <laughs> and we also did another thing, is that when we got letters like this, we published them on our website. And we kind of made it into a thing that we were supposed to reply to them in a really funny and disturbing way. This is one of my favorite uh, letters that we got. And it's from a German company called Linotype. And what they did is that they sent a letter saying, like, we have found that you can download these fonts from the Pirate Bay, and we own the copyright for them. And it's some of the most known fonts in the world, especially Helvetica, which probably everyone here has seen and used tons of time for your school works and everything. So they did not want anyone to be able to use or to download this font because they wanted everyone to pay a lot of money for them. Um, fonts is one of the few things actually exempted from copyright in Europe. So it's a total bullshit uh, letter, but also we did not have the content because it's a user sharing that to another user, because Pirate Bay is only a search engine. So we looked at this. I can admit now, I looked at this, and I uh, found out a really clever way to reply to this. So they sent a list, and they sent a contract that they wanted us to sign. It's really nice. It's really cool fonts in here and everything. So we copied this letter, and we sent it back that they had to sign this contract and pay us money instead of us paying them money. But we also used every font they complained about. <laughs> So I have no clue, you know, how they took this because they didn't reply. But I think they're, <laughs> they're pretty sure that we actually knew about where to find the fonts at least. Um, and this is really, really funny. Uh, I'm really sad that they wouldn't get, you know, a reply to this. Uh, and we published all of these. And it's like 20, 30 letters that we published that are really interesting and funny to learn. Some of them are actually examples at Harvard Law School um, for how to reply or not to reply, depending on your view on it, uh, to these uh, threats. And what happens when you start getting you know, a lot of people sending these letters is that you get a lot of attention. And first, you get a lot of attention from the media. And in the end, you get a lot of attention from different you know, people that have a problem with you. And we started noticing that we had a lot of users that liked us and a lot of users that actually, uh, you know, didn't have an alternative. So we started using them as part of our propaganda. Um, and we had different, you know, issues on the Internet. There was, uh, for instance, a very famous case in Scandinavia where there was uh, an ISP 
that decided that people are not allowed to buy music in Russia. Because you could buy music in Russia on a Russian website for a really low price, and it was totally legal to buy this music, and you could use it anywhere in Europe. But this ISP said that we're for uh, making sure that people are making money on the internet and blah, blah, blah. So they decided that they're going to shut out people's ability to actually trade with this, uh, this company in Russia, even though it was totally legal. So they blocked that website from being uh, accessible by their users. And we were really upset because a third party decided that this is okay and this is not okay on the internet without any court of law or anything like that. So what we did is that we realized basically 70% of their users are using Pirate Bay every single day. So we blocked all of those users from using Pirate Bay. And we put up a website saying that if you want to use the Pirate Bay, you have to switch to another uh, internet provider because we don't like that one. And we put up a phone number that you could call their customer support to complain about the situation. Also, we found out that they were in uh, violation of their own contract with the customer because they are not giving internet access, they're giving partial internet access. Um, so you could actually change in one day. And after a few days, they lost 30% of their customers. <laughs> they kicked their CEO, and in the end, they stopped banning parts of the internet. And for us, this was one of the first net neutrality cases that we kind of won by having some sort of consumer power. And we kept on going with kind of funny projects because we realized that in order to grow and in order to make people talk about interesting and important things about the internet, about net neutrality, about copyright and all of these things that we cared about, the best way was to do kind of pranks. Uh, and it's also very fun to do pranks. So, uh, for instance, I saw once, this is one of the last time I was drunk, by the way, I'm not going to go into details, but I saw that the, the small country called Sealand have you heard of it? Uh, a few people. So let me tell you. Sealand is an old platform outside of England. And in the 60s, someone came there and said, this is now a country because it's in international waters. And they took kind of this small platform and said, we're Sealand. Because there is a new Sealand, so we're going to be Sealand. Uh, a really clever guy. And they actually started a pirate radio out there. And since it's kind of close to England, they could send radio from that uh, platform into the UK without paying any license fees. So, very clever system. They also decided not to pay taxes in the UK, and the UK agreed with that in a court of law because it was outside their jurisdiction. So, they're kind of a country according to the UK. And they wanted to sell this country in 2008, I think. So, I started one of the first crowdfunding uh, sites on the internet, and I asked people to help me raise money so we could buy Sealand. <laughs> and that was kind of a idea, eating pizza, drinking beer, oh, let's buy a country, sure, <laughs> sounds like a fun thing. <laughs> We've all been there, you know? Um, and after two days, we raised like $25,000, and we started having a problem, because we were now one of the biggest web pages on the internet. So from nowhere, this separate website is not part of Pirate Bay. Uh, it was so much traffic there, how we, we had to get new servers and everything. But the biggest problem was still drunk, um, and I think the Prince of Sealand and the head of Disney Channel and the Warner Brothers were on Larry King show talking about the issue, what will happen when the Pirate Bay has their own country? What kind of rules can there be? How does international copyright work? And we're sitting here watching this kind of prank and realize we have way too much people believing us. Um, <laughs> But we also had money, that was an issue. Um, and in the end, when we were, we've always been only three people in the Pirate Bay. So it's been me, it's been Frederick and Gottfried. I will show you some video clips afterwards, so you will see how, kind of how stupid they are. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we could not decide what to do with the money. And the Prince of Sealand said that basically he wanted six billion dollars. And he did this thing, I think, like, you know, in Austin Powers. Um, <laughs> But, and we of course didn't have that money. I think we raised like $50,000 or something in the end. Uh, and he got a movie deal out of not selling to us. Good for him. Uh, and basically I decided to buy rainforest in Brazil for all of this money and Frederick and Godfrey was really upset with me. So that was the last time I was drunk. Good thing to be drunk sometimes. So our opponents were like, they didn't understand what we were doing. They didn't understand what kind of the ideas we had and how we worked and if we're a company, if we're an organization and if, you know, if we're organized or how we are. And some people a actually said that we're organized crime. And I argued in a debate once that no, we're disorganized crime, you know, so at least keep the words straight. And 
this is really interesting, like something which is so fluid and you all know how this works because you're from the internet generation, so you know, you know, things just happen sometimes. It doesn't have to be organized. But the art community loved us, so we got invited to lots of art shows and, you know, we started exhibiting Pirate Bay as an art piece and people got really upset about that because, you know, it's not art, it's crime. So, well, crime can be art and, you know, other way around. Um, one of the things we did, we bought an old bus from Stockholm and we drove it to Italy and exhibited it at one of the biggest art festivals in the world. So all of a sudden these guys, these Hollywood types, they are sitting there like, this, these people tried buying a country, now they're artists and you know, what's happening with my copyright? I don't understand this, who can I sue? <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm gonna see, I don't know which clip this is. And this is actually me. This is from uh, the documentary about the Pirate Bay, which you can download. This is how good friends we are in the Pirate Bay. I just want to show you this. Can someone turn the lights down a bit? Is that possible? Broke up is a fucking vegetarian lefty big ass bastard. He got bought because he's in the Pirate Bay, right? He's giving all the interviews. He's still a bitch. He does it because of ideological uh, pussy in the afflicted instincts. He needs to look himself in the ass and take his own life in his hands. If he's really right, he's got a drink or two. Then he's the best man on Earth. And the problem is that he takes one or two drinks. And this, this is how we as like the three people are communicating all the time. This is like they could not understand like these people, they don't even like each other. They don't agree with anything, but still like the, the biggest problem we have, you know, in the world right now, all of these Hollywood types were thinking this. So what do you do if you have a problem like that? Well, if you're from Hollywood, you send a private investigator after these people because what we're doing on the Internet can really be used, you know, you can really spy on that with a guy following you around. How many people have been followed by a private investigator? <laughs> Show of hands, only, only one. I can tell you, if you want to go into a business, it's really easy to be a private investigator because most of them suck. <laughs> so, as I said, we were three people. Um, like Frederick that you saw before, he, he's still an alcoholic. Uh, <laughs> and when they followed this Frederick around, basically they saw a guy that went to basically every bar in the city every day. <laughs> and it was a lot of paperwork describing where he went. And they tr were trying to find out where Pirate Bay had their servers. Uh, and then we had Gottfried, another, the other guy from, from Pirate Bay. And they were following him for six weeks. And they saw him once because he's a nerd and he does not go out. <laughs> so, so they could see people coming to his place with three pizzas and then they're coming out with three empty boxes with pizzas. <laughs> Basically that's what happened and there was like a half a page. And when they followed me around I noticed that uh, I was living in Sweden and southern parts very close to Denmark and I, I'm living in not fancy area but you know all of a sudden there's this big Porsche Cayenne standing like very close to my, to my house and I'm actually for some reason uh, I'm getting pizza uh, and I'm coming back to my apartment and I see this flash going off in a car. It's in the middle of the night so it's dark outside and a flash in a car is really visible. So I go over to uh, this car and I want to see who is this guy, you know, what's his deal? And the guy just dri drives off like really quickly and you know, he thinks he's gonna get away. But I know that you can write down the license plates, you know? <laughs> <coughs> and if you, this is my tip to you guys that want to be private investigators. First thing, if you have a car, don't register it to your company called private investigators. <laughs> you know, really easy to find out what's going on. Um, so, you know, they sent these guys after us, they didn't find out anything of interest, but then they realized, well, if we don't know how to actually, you know, find any information about them, let's talk shit about them. So they started. Vi kan konstatera att PK har haft kunder som vissa har velat koppla både till terror, piratkopiering och droger. Det går inte att förneka riktigt. Och jag skulle gissa alla tre samtidigt för en enda enskild kund. För det är en bra trifaktor. 
Han är pirat, han är ett knäckare. Och eh, alltså, när man pratar med honom så blir man ju lite rädd när man ser på honom. Ja, han är, han är taliban kan man ju säga. So, uh, I, I didn't tell you before, PRQ was the hosting company, the web hosting company that uh, Pirate Bay was kind of running and uh, was running Pirate Bay, how do you want to look at it? And Gottfried and Fredrik worked mostly with, with PRQ and we have lots of interesting customers uh, during this period. Pirate Bay was one of them. Uh, we also have like the rebel movement of uh, Chechnya that got closed down in every country in the world and, and we hosted them because we found out that it's really, you know, no one knows how to host sensitive stuff, even if it's legal, that was an issue. So we started doing all of this, and the anti-pirates found out this is a really good way of attacking. Let's call them terrorists, let's call them pirates, let's call them whatever. Uh, and my favorite thing is, I was watching one of my favorite shitty TV series called Covert Affairs. Have you seen it? It's an American bad spy uh, series. Uh, and I'm watching this, eating popcorn, whatever, and I see all of a sudden this clip. Natasha Petrovna, born and raised in St. Petersburg, graduate degree in computer security from Lomonsov University, now a member of the Swedish-founded Pirate Bureau. Car-carrying anarchist. So, even in the series, they're now talking that we're terrorists. So, but in, what we always did is that when someone said that we were pirates, we made pirates being cool. And then they said that, well, you're terrorists, whatever, you have weapons of something, you know, they're doing this. We made that cool. So. After this, we released this video. There's a lot of video. Yeah. So we have them, we have the weapons of mass distribution. Uh, and that, that has been kind of the idea every time someone calls us something. Uh, we just said, well, okay, let's be that thing. That's not an issue for us. You know, we're going to be really, really, you know, whatever you want to call it. So it's cool to be a terrorist. It's cool to be a pirate, whatever. Uh, and then, you know, we started hosting WikiLeaks. Yeah, I remember when mm -hmm. we became friends with them. Said, yes, this is a funny story from that. And they need some help because they're like under more attack than ever. Well, the first time I really got in contact was when we had to pay a bill, which I still remember oh, because yeah. no one, and that was a constant problem we had. No one remembered the stupid customer number and no one wanted to say anything on the phone and stuff. So I remember in 2008, I flew to Sweden to pay the bill in cash. Oh, oh okay. So okay. Gottfried always said he didn't want to have money from WikiLeaks. Oh, but we paid, I, I mean, I flew there and I paid for one year and I paid for a bit in, in advance. Okay. So, well, Julian was with me. He, was, he, he flew in as well. And then we arranged this meeting with Gottfried. Um, to hand over the money. And this was <laughs> one of the weirdest, weirdest incidents in my life. He came to the hotel and he had someone waiting outside in a car. And they had some kind of agreement that Gottfried would always be near a door, uh, near a window. And he, so he stood there in this lobby <coughs> with his long hair and, and he looked completely Strange. Strange. Yeah, and he up. behaved really strange. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then every half a minute he turned around to see if the car was, the guy in the car was still there. And, and Julian and I, we were standing there and we basically, we thought we would just, I don't know, go hang out or something yeah. like yeah. this. So we asked him if he wants to come up to the, to the room where it's a bit better than standing in a hotel lobby. And he was all like, no, 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 I can't. I, I can't leave you turning, turning around all the time. Oh, that was strange. Never heard that before. And then handing over some cash, and the, and the guy left and jumped in the car, and they drove off. And we felt like, hmm, okay, well, that was, that was meeting PRQ for us. Yeah. So, so this is kind of what how strange even WikiLeaks thought we were strange, you know. And if Julian Assange thinks you're strange, something's wrong with you. Um, <laughs> let me tell you that. So after a while, uh, we started getting so much attention and we had lots of sensitive customers and we did lots of things and basically everyone who had an issue with being shut down for freedom of expression reasons or anything like that, they came to us and asked for help. They asked for hosting, they asked for advice because we, we had been running a website that everyone wanted to take down and we've been running it successfully for years and years and years. So in the end, the Swedish police uh, got invited to, uh, and the Swedish authorities got invited to the White House uh, because Hollywood was really, really upset because they couldn't shut us down and we didn't shut down voluntarily. So um, 
sorry, um, basically the, the Minister of Justice from Sweden and the Minister of Foreign Affairs had to go to the White House and they talked to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the US and the Trade Minister and everything like that and basically they said, what's going on with the Pirate Bay? And the Swedish uh, people said that the prosecutor looked into it, it's totally legal and, you know, it, there's, we can't do anything about it. So the American people said, well, then we're not going to trade with you. We're going to stop trading with Sweden altogether if you don't shut down the Pirate Bay. And we're going to go to the World Trade Organization and say we can't trade with Sweden anymore. So you have an issue if you don't shut it down. Even though there's no legal basis, the basis is, you know, you're going to lose a lot of money. And Sweden can't not sell ABBA. They can't sell IKEA stuff. They can't sell, you know, they have to sell Volvos. You know, it's really important for them. So uh, the the people came back and they decided, let's send 50 cops to take these people's computers and everything. It's going to be fine. Just they just wanted to close down the whole site. And what happened is that after you know after the raid, um, three days after, there was a big demonstration in in Stockholm, just outside of the government building, and there was thousands of people there, and they were really upset about the U because it, it came um, uh, public uh, knowledge that the U.S. was behind all of this. People were really upset that the U.S. decided what Sweden could and couldn't do. So people had banners like this, which is my viewing of this. It's that says, give us back the servers or we're going to take your fax machine. <laughs> you know, it's very clearly uh, that the younger generation understands what's going on and the older generation, they're kind of stupid. Um, let's see, I have another clip. <coughs> oh, sorry, before, before I do this, hang on, I'm going to tell you a story again. Uh, yeah, so it didn't really work, you know. So Pirate Bay get, got uh, up again after three days, and it would have been two days if Gottfried wasn't that drunk. Um, <laughs> I can tell you another story. Actually, you know, have you been to these seminars where they talk about uptime and how you can improve the reliability of the internet and everything? I went to one of those uh, once with a guy from Cisco that said about, you know, we can guarantee 99, but not 99.5% uptime. You know, we can do this and this and this. And I told him the story when Gottfried once tripped over a fiber cable while being high in the data center, and half of the internet actually did not work for three days. <laughs> and I'm not kidding, because half of the traffic in the cables went down because Pirate Bay was down. Um, so I told him, just give us money instead, employ us. That would be a much better solution than spending billions on actually you know, doing R&D for Cisco. Uh, but so you know, we decided this, this court case that's going to be, you know, they, they sued us and everything. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But you know, and Hollywood realized that nothing will change. So they tried a new tactic. So um, they said we were a cult. <laughs> Let's see where we're going with this. Till att börja med så tror jag inte på att det skulle finnas någon form av, av idé hos vanliga ungdomar om att upphovsrätt skulle vara fel eller så. Det, 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 det tror jag är en myt och den har, den har liksom de här, den här kopimistsekten varit väldigt duktiga på att marknadsföra. Ja, så de kallar oss en cult. And that's, that's really funny, because this woman that you saw, who's the lawyer for, the, uh, for Hollywood in Europe, she's also the lawyer for the Scientology Church of Europe. <laughs> so she should know what a cult is. She's working for them. Uh, so first they called us, you know, pirates. We made that cool. They called us terrorists. Well, I'm not going to say terrorism is cool, but you terrorizing people can be cool. So they called us a cult. So I started researching is there anything good in being a cult? Maybe there is a good thing by it. So uh, I, I researched that there, is a new, there was a new uh, law in Sweden that the state church split. So you could start your own religion as long as you had some sort of Bible and you had some sort of belief. <laughs> it's 50 euros to start a religion. I'm not done, it's get, it gets better. <laughs> so uh, I've always been very fond of, of playing with words and stuff, so uh, I'm going to tell you stu funny stuff. But uh, I've also found out that, you know, the data retention directive and all of these monitoring laws and everything that's being passed all over Europe, all over the world. In Europe, there is always an exemption that, you know, because there is a big lobby group called religious people, especially from like the Vatican Church and everything, they don't want anyone to be able to spy on soulful communication, as they say. So when you do confessions, 
you know, the priest is not allowed to tell anyone what you said. And there's actually exemptions in all of these laws that says you cannot monitor any form of, uh, of confession, on, even online. So if, if you monitor someone who's uh, you know, talking to their priest, uh, that would be illegal. I even more illegal than copyrights in a violation, you know? So if someone would actually violate that, hmm, that might be interesting. So we looked at uh, the Mormon church and found out that they consider everyone to be a priest in their church. So we decided that hmm, this P2P communication, it doesn't have to be peer-to-peer. -peer. It could be priest-to-priest -priest communication. <laughs> so, in the end, <coughs> this, this is a few weeks wild. after. Some people seem uh, to worship technology, but now it's being recognized as a religion. Yes, in Sweden, a church whose central tenet is the right to file share has been formally recognized by the Swedish government. It's called the Church of Copy Meism, uh, I guess. <laughs> copy Meism or Copy Mism. Okay, and it claims that copy acting, sharing information through copying, is akin to a religious service. Yeah, it is. So I'm actually, I, you know, I haven't said, but I was in jail quite recently, and I'm I'm vegan, so they didn't want to give me vegan food. So I, yeah, thank you, one guy. <laughs> And he's applauding because I didn't get vegan food. So what happened is that I found out that you know, they have to serve me food according to my religion. So I called the guys up and said, can you please enter into the Bible that you have to be vegan if you're a copamist? <laughs> so they had to give me vegan food because of religious reasons. Anyhow, um, so we kind of grew. Soon the most shameful moment of today is coming. Uh, we, we grew and grew and we got a lot of attention and other people that were kind of more organized than us, they said that, well, maybe this thing, this pirate movement, whatever you want to call it, once should be a party. So someone started the pirate party. We've been asked to do that before, but we kind of don't like those types of parties. Normal parties is okay, but not political parties. Um, so someone else did, and they were, have been kind of successful. They have people in the European Parliament and everything like that, and, and that's kind of been in their own movement. And I don't really like the Pirate Party all the time, but I decided that I want to try basically everything in the world sometime. So I actually entered to run for European Parliament last election in 2014, last year. Um, and I have a video, because I don't want to do like everyone else does. I'm going to, if you're sensitive to really embarrassing stuff, please don't look. This was my campaign video for running for the European Union election. And it's, I, I'm honest to say, it's the most viewed campaign video of the European Union election last year. <laughs> I'm not going to watch. Thanks. I didn't get enough votes. <laughs> Maybe I don't. I don't know. It, it's kind of. It, wa it was kind of interesting though. Um, anyhow, but but what we've been doing, which is more important, is that we're going around talking about why file sharing is good and why you know copyright is an interesting thing. Uh, a few years ago, I was in Brazil and I was hanging out with these people. Maybe you, the guy in the middle with the ugly beard. Uh, he's uh, Richard Stallman. He's the founder of the Free Software Foundation. He's when you talk about free software in GNU, he's the guy who invented it. And we met with the guy over there, which is the Brazilian President Lula. I, you probably, being in Portugal, you have some sort of recognition. Uh, you might know who the guy is. I've never been to Brazil before this, and uh, I was at this free software kind of conference, and, and someone said, oh, we're going to meet the president. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, the president of the organization. Yeah, sure, that's cool. <laughs> uh, because mostly when politicians, when I asked to talk to a politician, they said, well, I'm not going to talk to you. Uh, forget that. Um, so all of a sudden, I'm standing in there like, I recognize this man, you know. And he's very, very polite, and he's going over, and he's saying hi to everyone and shaking their hands. And I'm like, oh, it's the president of the goddamn country. Uh, <laughs> And I'm really stupid, like I don't know that much about him. I just like, I know that people like him and I don't understand why. Then he comes up to me and it's my turn to say hi and he's been really, really careful and everything. 
and someone tells me who I am, and he says like, oh, wow, and he gives me a big hug, and he starts messing with my hair and says like, take pictures of us, take pictures of us. <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on? I don't understand what's going on here. And then he says something in Portuguese to his uh, uh, interpreter that says, well, President Lula wants you to realize that Sweden and Brazil has no extradition treaty. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I just wish that European politicians could be that nice. <laughs> so essentially, now I'm going to talk a little bit more serious because I've done all of the unserious stuff. Uh, I want to talk about like kind of the history of copying because I want to put it this into context, kind of what these people that are fighting us are fighting. So if you go back like a hundred years in time, you had something called like silent movies. I don't, I don't think every, anyone here has seen one, but you didn't have music attached to movies. So all of the movies that were in black and white, they had people playing pianos and stuff uh, in the theater. So when you go and saw a movie, there was actual musicians playing in that audience um, and making money from that. And they tried, when, when they, like the, the talkies, as they called it, movies with actual sound came out, they tried suing all of the uh, movie companies for releasing this because they, these musicians were losing their jobs. So they said that these, these shitty new movies with sound, we don't like them. We're going to sue their ass off and we're going to make sure that this is illegal. And of course they fail, which has been a tremendous success for the movie industry because they make more money. And musicians has been kind of, it, it, it's the thing that has been affected mostly by copyright and gone furthest with copyright discussions. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, but if you look back like 100, 50 years, people that made music, they played out in streets and they could make their money only from playing live gigs and everything and they played at weddings and they played in the streets and people pay them. And they were really upset because someone found out a way to record the music. And they said, well, we don't like this because if you record the music, no one will pay us to play more than once. And so they were really upset about this. So they tried banning recording music in general uh, ages ago. And that didn't work, which was good because the musicians made more money because people bought these albums and after they bought them, they wanted to listen to even more. So they bought more albums and then they wanted to listen to the real thing because it sounds better than on a gramophone. So they were really happy about that after you know 30 years. Then radio came and I think you're gonna guess what happens. People are really upset because, oh, there's gonna be someone broadcasting my music, so they're not gonna buy my albums anymore. They're just gonna listen to the radio and how am I gonna make money from this? But it turned out that radio made people listen to even more music and people paid more music in license fees. So it was a really good thing that they failed in suing you know, these radio companies. Because if they did, they wouldn't have made as much money and people got more interested in music. So it was really good. Ah, <sighs> it just goes on. Then someone invented like the cassette player and all of a sudden you could record music coming out of the radio. And people saying, no, 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 this is going too far, you know. People can now record the music from the radio and I will not make money from the radio anymore because that's my main income. I'm making shitload of money from radio, but I'm not going to do that anymore. Let's sue the people that are selling these cassette players. And what happened is that all of a sudden you had something like an, a Walkman, you could carry around the music and people listen to music everywhere. So they bought more music, they paid more license fees and they found out the way that, well, this was the best thing ever happening to the music industry. So, you know, then the CD came and people said, well, you know, this is not good because the music is such much better quality that no one will go to concerts because the music is perfect on CDs kind of wrong. Sorry for the crappy photo, you know, being from Scandinavia, this is what we do. We do. <laughs> um, but people really like, the record companies were okay because you couldn't copy the CD in the beginning, but, and you could resell all of the music over and over again, and it's really hard to copy the music in perfect quality until people invented the CD burner and all of that. So it's going on the same thing, and people are suing everyone all the time, but every time there's a new technology, the musicians are making more money. Then internet came and people could make MP3s and send to each other all over the internet. And all of a sudden you could reach markets you know, that you didn't have before and you could reach new audiences and everything. And the record companies were really, really upset about all of this because you couldn't control it and they were kind of cut out of the, of, of the loop because we cut out the middlemen. But the musicians are happy about it, but the record companies are not that happy about it because they don't control the, the thing. So they've been trying to find like um, people like me to cut the head off because they think this is some sort of revolution and you can just cut the head off a guy and they will scare the other people away and make sure that they keep control and everything. But 
it's not a revolution, all of this technology is an evolution, invented by this man, Darwin. Uh, because this is just like technology evolving a little bit all the time, and it's, uh, you know, um, we should rather think of what we want to achieve with, uh, with culture and, and copyright. And when we had the court case in Sweden, uh, I actually wanted to put focus on, you know, what's actually going on, who's making money from copyright, who's making money when someone is illegally downloading this money, or the, the music. So I invited a guy called Roger Wallace, who's a professor at the university in Sweden. Um, and he's researching copyright and, and the music industry. And he's also a musician himself. Um, and so he was uh, a witness in the Pirate Bay case. And what happened is that a lot of the people on the opposing side, from Warner Brothers and Universal, all of these studios, they couldn't find arguments against him. They could, you know, they didn't find arguments against the research that he was talking about in the court case. So they started asking, so like, how many percentages of your, you know, of your work time is as a professor? Because he was employed uh, for 20% of his time, so they said he's only 20% of a professor, so you can only take his arguments 20% seriously, which is like totally stupid. So. He got kind of butchered in, in the court by, uh, by these people. It's an old, nice man. But people off the internet, they are nice. So they sent him flowers as hell. Here's another movie clip. It's now two or three days since uh, the court appearance. Um, and I'm starting to look through all the blogs around the world. And I'm looking here at the US now, torrent free, Pirate Bay's witness overwhelmed with flowers. And, and an awful lot of very kind people who wrote just saying, at last somebody from the older generation, I mean, I'm an old man, who seems to understand the way we think. I also make the point here that as a composer, which I am, I mean, a song I wrote bought our first house. I support copyright, but only if copyright really has a function of uh, encouraging creativity, you know, an economic uh, incitement or an incentive to create. Not the way copyright's developing now is a huge control mechanism for people who sit on large swathes of um, rights. So basically this is the me only message I have for you today, besides all of the crazy stories and all of that, that's just because I, I think I want, I want to be a comedian one day. Uh, actually I write comedy as a side gig. Uh, but for me, it's really important that we discuss copyright, why we have it, if we're going to have it, because the future is going to be all about digital technology. We're always going to have, everything is going to be something you download, something, you know, you talk about software as a service, someone is controlling that. Information is much more valuable than all of the oil in the world has ever been. You know, all of these things that you are doing, all of the technology is like, it's the biggest industry in the world, it's more valuable than anything, and everyone is, that has money is going to want more money, so they're going to try to control it. So for me, when I look at the future, I'm looking at stuff like uh, 3D printers. I want to be able to download a pair of pants and print them, and this is not a joke anymore. We know that in like 15 years, that's how people are going to do. That's going to get rid of child labor in, you know, in Asia, we're going to get rid of shitty things that we don't need to send all over the world, all of this, and Hopefully, someone will make a way for us to reuse what we print so that, you know, if it's plastic, we can melt them at home and we can print out something new. A friend of mine is printing as much as he can with his 3D printer, so he has only forks and spoons made out of plastic, printed, illegally downloaded copies of IKEA stuff. <laughs> and this is, this is not even a joke. This is what's going on today, and it's going to be even better and better and better. And the people controlling the copyright is able to control what's going to go on in the future. And we're talking about maybe stuff, but we're also going to talk about, like, you, people are going to be able to download meat and other uh, things as well. So, you know, we have Spotify today. I think we're going to have Foodify in 25 years, where you stream your food from. And it's not an unrealistic thought, but the things that we decide today, who's going to control the information, uh, that's going to decide the future quite a lot. I don't know why I have this slide, but I have this. Uh, that says thank you and bye. And if you have questions, let's talk, because it's better to talk than just listening. Thank you.
guys, I'm, I'm from Scandinavia. We have this thing, everyone's equal. Please don't do that. It's embarrassing to me. But thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Can we send out the microphone if anyone has a question? There's a guy there. He has a microphone. I have a microphone too. Let's talk. If we have time for it. Do we have time? Yeah. OK, good. And you don't have to talk to me. You can talk to each other as well. OK. Um, hi. Um, I'd like to say it was a great presentation. Congratulations. And Thank, thank you. <laughs> huh? And I would like to know what's your stand on net neutrality. I think it's pretty clear, but I would like to know a little bit more of what you think about it. I, I think that uh, one of the biggest issues I have with net neutrality is that there's different definitions of it. And uh, for me, uh, basically, it's, 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 it's similar to roads. You don't put taxes on roads, and you d don't dis you know, decide who can go to certain addresses and, and so on. Uh, I think that if you start blocking domain names, because of the content on the domain names. In the future, you're going to block people's addresses when you go in your iPod. And an iPod is not going to be a music player. It's going to be a pod that you're driving in. Uh, and you're going to go around with that. And someone is going to say, well, that address does not exist in our registry. Uh, so if you look at it at a more you know, historical and longer perspective, it's really dangerous to start touching um, the infrastructure of something. So net neutrality is not only net neutrality. It's actually the basis for the future. So I think it's, it's super important that we just don't interfere with it. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I was uh, thinking during the presentation that, well, you are, in fact, a face of activism within uh, freedom of uh, enforced copyright and everything. But did you ever, you know, actually fought to be the f uh, a, a very important part of that activism? Or did actually people just uh, starting to see you and starting to rise you up towards th that role? Uh, and it became get bigger and bigger. Yeah, th what happened with Pipe is that we did not understand that it would become a big deal. We just said, well, we don't want to shut down when people said we had to. So it just kind of grew out of that. And from the beginning, I actually used a fake name. So I used Peter Copy Me. And I said it was a French word, so it was Copy Me, you know, something <laughs> like that. Uh, and all the journalists quoted me as that. And I didn't send out the picture. I actually, uh, I, I don't have the picture here, but a friend of mine took a picture of me. Uh, he's a photographer, and he photoshopped it, the hell out of it, sent it to Rolling Stone and said, you can't copy it for more than once. It's all over the internet. Everyone stole it and published it in their magazines. That was the only picture of me for a while. Uh, in the end, I decided that you know, someone has to speak about it, and we decided that we're going to be open with whom we are, because it's important to have some sort of face, even though those faces are ugly or you know, full of drugs or alcohol. It doesn't really matter, because you need to have someone speaking. And when we started this, people on TV talking about, uh, you know, downloading music, whatever, they had pixels in their face when they were on TV. Like, uh, these people, it was like using drugs. So for us, it was important to make that into a human thing, that everyone is downloading stuff. So we, it was really important for us to have faces. So you can't really ask someone else to put their face up if you do not going to do it yourself. Mm, I see. Uh, just uh, one uh, smaller question. Uh, I was... You know, just uh, just thinking. Uh, after you became such a huge deal, uh, you talked about uh, how you had the private investigators, the awful private investigators. After you, uh, how many eyes do you actually have on you every day, uh, especially since you were in prison and like yeah. Some so um, there is, you know, I, I don't really know, but I, I'm 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 stopping to care because um, I, I don't think that I will have much of a private life like that way. I have some privacy, of course, but um, it goes to certain you know, degrees. I travel a lot, so it's hard to follow me around. Um, so that's okay. But, you know, um, my, some of my friends are like Daniel from WikiLeaks. He's a little bit more uh, hidden than I am. He's trying to be a little bit more safe, so he does not have a cell phone, for instance. So he's really hard to get in touch with. And I don't want to become to that stage where I don't have a phone, so I can't communicate with my friends and family and stuff. So I'm giving up parts of that, parts of the privacy, in order to be a functioning part of society. So other people, like I'm not on Facebook. So I don't get invited to events because I'm not on Facebook. 
uh, so people don't want to call me. They remember once or twice and maybe three times and then it just becomes a hassle. Maybe it's one or two people that's not on Facebook. You don't want to call them. It's just like, you know, it's not that important. Uh, but I'm the guy in my group that uh, have the most active social life because the other ones don't even have phones. So, you know, I it's all, you know, people look at what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm, I'm messing with them sometimes, but it's not that bad. I can tell you a story. I have a, a good friend, Jacob Applebaum from WikiLeaks. He's being uh, followed everywhere. So he's, uh, he, he went to uh, the US f after being in Berlin once. And he knows that the police and uh, you know, the, the customs will stop him whenever he goes there. So he does not bring a computer because they will search his computer. So he once brought two USB sticks uh, and said he got them from friends. And basically, that was the only thing that was digital that he had. And uh, they, of course, wanted to investigate what's on the USB sticks, and they couldn't find anything. They were like, looked like they were blank, but they were certain this guy from WikiLeaks, he does not have blank USB sticks. So they started reading like byte block per block on the USB stick. There's no file system. It's just like the first byte on this USB stick, and then the next one, the next one. Like it's a text file. And the guy from the customs comes back and says, uh, I don't understand this. There's like, on both of these USB sticks, there's the copy of the Constitution. He says, oh, so you know my rights now. You can keep one of them. <laughs> you know, so you have to play with it. So, you know, in the end, they're going to stop following you around because they're going to realize that, you know, there is no interesting stuff there. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, hi. Here. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I have a question because of the, uh, the video where uh, the... Uh, the person you uh, used as a, wis a witness was talking about the copyright yeah. laws. I was wondering if you have the same opinion of him that the copyright law could need could be saved and reused, or if you think it is totally hopeless. Actually, to be totally honest, I don't care. Um, it's not my problem. Uh, I'm if you're a business that make money out of copyright and other businesses are making money from that as a part of their profit scheme, you know that they're abusing know someone else's work sure they can discuss it and maybe they can find a solution I'm I'm only interested in what it does for humanity for humanity and society so I'm only talking about end users like people participating in culture and that's the only thing I care about and copyright is a problem for them and one of the things I, I realized when growing up is that every time you talk about a problem every politician everyone who's like active in that discussion has to have the solution which means that you're opposing a solution with your solution. So you're comparing solutions, which means that if you don't, if, if I just say I don't care about copyright, I'm just criticizing it, it's, it's, it's okay. Someone else can find a solution. I'm not clever enough um, and I'm not interested enough. So yeah, might have a place, but I don't care. Uh, my personal question was, since you have already been imprisoned and you're out now, yep. I don't really understand how this works, but what are the stands on uh, the rest of the world regarding you? Do you have problems going anywhere now? Are you free? Uh, I'm more free than most of you. Uh, a long story. But uh, I, I can go to the US, but I can't leave. <laughs> you can look at it that way. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I can go everywhere and, you know, and leave everywhere, I think. OK, last question, guy over there. Uh, Peter will be in showcase upstairs, so if you have any other questions, please go upstairs and talk to him, okay? Will I? <laughs> I, I, really? I didn't know, I didn't have a schedule. Hey, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, um, what do you want to do now specifically? Where do you want to put your energy? I'm, I'm putting my energy quite a lot of different places. Uh, I'm doing some TV stuff, which is important for me because I want to get uh, attention from the people that I don't have a reach to. So like getting attention on the internet is kind of okay, but I would only reach the same audience that I would do before. So I want to get the kind of the mainstream attention. So I'm, I'm talking about dif with different companies about producing a, a TV series um, uh, that we're going to do this year. I'm also focusing more on kind of net art stuff because I, I want to find different ways that are interesting to me personally to kind of get, uh, you know, talk about things. Um, and it's less interesting for most people, so I get to do it more in, in private, that people don't, don't care that much. I also have a lot of different projects that I'm involved in that I've either started or been part of for so long that I'm like, 
like on boards and stuff, uh, whatever you want to call it, it's not that organized. So um, uh, last year we started a uh, um, competitor to WhatsApp, you if you want to call it that, called Hemless, which is uh, a secure messaging app for your phone that we're going to release sometime this year. I'm uh, not really sure when. Uh, the prison thing kind of got in the way. Uh, and that's not a joke. Um, so so I'm, I'm doing stuff like that. and. Uh, but I'm not really organized and I'm not really focused enough to do things, which is my kind of my biggest flaw and my biggest, you know, the best thing with me because I just go around. I don't take responsibility for anything. So that that's good for me. More questions? No. Done. Oh, okay. So thank you, Peter. So we would like to thank Peter for coming. Uh, it was a great talk. I th I'm sure everyone liked it a lot. Uh, Peter will be upstairs for the showcase right now if anyone needs to talk to him or just wants an autograph. Uh, I remind everyone that if you want to uh, be present at our startup rush with the main Portuguese startups, uh, tech startups, and uh, applying the most mind-blowing challenges, you need to enroll today. It starts tomorrow and it goes uh, up until Saturday. And I hope you enjoyed the 20 seconds info. Thank you all. Goodbye. See you next year.